Thank you for watching video from One Church of High Point. We hope that today's message encourages you to connect to God, to others, and to your purpose. If you're looking for more information about One Church or for more resources, visit onechurchnc.net. Hey. Yeah, you, you get it on Father's Day. I got to get a coach. I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm going to stay in my lane, amen. Mother's Day, Mother's Day, Mother's Day. Let's, let's jump right into scripture real quick. Um, if you have your Bible, let's Bible apps. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. I almost forgot um, that this week was Mother's Day because I was already preparing to go into our walk through Ephesians, which is Ephesians 3. And then at the last moment, I'm like, oh, man, let me honor the mother. So we're going to pivot from our study that we've been in for the past month or so as we're walking through the book of Ephesians. And so today, um, this message is specifically for our mothers. And I want to just lift that up to them to give honor to them this morning. If you have it, say amen. 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 First Kings chapter three, verses 16, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now, two women who were harlots came to the king and stood before him. And one of the women said, oh, my Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house. And I gave birth while she was in the house. Then it happened on the third day after I had given birth that this woman also gave birth. And we were together. No one was with us in the house except the two of us that was in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. So she arose in the middle of the night and took my son from my side. While your maidservant slept and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. That's just scandalous. And when I rose in the morning to the nurse to nurse my son, there he was dead. But when I had examined him in the morning, indeed, he was not my son whom I had born. Then the other woman said, no, but the living one is my son and the dead one is your son. And the first woman said, no. But the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. And the king said, the one says, this is my son who lives, and your son is the one that is dead. And the other one says, no, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. Then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son and said, oh, my Lord, give her the living child and by no means kill him. But the other said, Let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him. So the king answered and said, give the first woman the living child and by no means kill him. She is his mother. Pastor Ryan, where are you going with this text? Is this like a crazy Mother's Day reading, right? The title of my message today is A Mother's Love. A Mother's Love. There's some things that mom can say that is kind of unwritten in a book. You know, like dads, we have a dad book, we have a marriage book, but there's a bro book, you know, there's a bro code, a mother's code. But for mothers, there's some things that mothers would say that is kind of like, It's unwritten. You know, there's not a book that says once you become a mother, these are the things that you need to say and how to kind of say them or whatever. But 
It's kind of unwritten. It's, it's innate into a mother. And so I'm just going to kind of highlight some of my motherly sayings that I've heard through my rearing of children from my wife and from my mom. And I'm sure, ladies, you can echo what I say. I'm going to count to. Come on, moms. I'm going to count to three. Don't play with your food. You haven't even tried it yet. How many times do I have to tell you? Okay, mom, when we walk into the store, don't ask for nothing. <laughs> and don't touch nothing. Right? And you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Oh, this is one of my favorite. I only whip you because... Can you love me less, mom? And then I went to the Urban Dictionary because I wanted to kind of get the black mama's perspective real quick. You know, since we are a multi-ethnic church and, you know, I am black, whatever, certain days I might be white, Latino, whatever it is. A hard head makes a, yeah, it be, don't, don't say it, don't say it. When I was growing up, I got a three-letter word. <laughs> but my mama, she's redeemed and restored. Praise Jesus. Amen. Yes. Yes, she is. Come on now. Boy, I heard that once or twice or three times. My mama used to tell us that um, you have champagne taste with a, no, no, with a Kool-Aid budget. Meaning that you have like all this exotic taste, but you don't have any money to buy what you want. Like, you know, so. My mom always used to say this, stop crying before I give you something to cry about. <laughs> if someone hits you first, you hit them back. Come on now, y'all know that. How about this one? Mom, can we get some McDonald's? You got. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Y'all y'all know what it is. Do you have McDonald's money, right? And this is for all mamas. The thing that's always the response when we ask why it is. Because I said so. There's something about the gift of motherhood and how God uses a woman to nurture, shape, and just love children. If we were to take a look back at history, every culture, every country across this world, mothers are celebrated. Go back to the Greco Roman culture. The goddess Rhea was the mother of all gods, the mother of all gods. Go back to the fourth century, the Catholic Church and their celebration of Mary. If you were to look at the 17th century on Mothering Day, it was the day where Britain allowed women to go back home to play homage to their mom. 20th century, 1914, President Woodrow Wilson wrote Sunday, May the 9th, as an official holiday for Mother's Day. All across the world, all throughout history, we can see that mothers are truly respected and highlighted in almost every country. Three fun facts about Mother's Day. Mother's Day is typically the third most heavily attended for church services. Mother's Day is one of the one, the first or second most purchased day where flowers are bought. It kind of changes out with Valentine's Day. And, and that's rightly so, right? Because I'm thinking like, if you can't get flowers from your boo, at least you can get flowers for your, mo your mama, right? That's how it typically works. And lastly, a great indicator about Mother's Day is when you leave her today and you try to pull into a restaurant to go eat and you don't have reservations, it's going to be at least a two to three hour wait. <laughs> Fellas, I'm sorry. We don't have as much highlight as Mother's Day. But one thing I can say this, 
is that mothers help shape who we are today. And as we look at 1 Kings chapter 3, it's a very significant story where we begin to look at what two mothers are dealing with, but one in particular. And I like this because it highlights just so much into this passage. As we look at this, and I'm looking at the scriptures in 1 Kings chapter 3, the lady is not named. It's not Mary, it's not Rebecca, it's not Rachel, it's not, you know, it's not Edith, it's not any of those names. It's not, there's the mother goes unnamed in this scripture. And oftentimes when we don't see a specific name, theologians say that's where we can insert ourselves into this particular piece of passage because this is how we can kind of correlate or relate ourselves or just in that time frame. And also, I believe that it also reflects the many things that moms do that they don't get credit for. Right? Mothers don't get full credit for all that they do. There's so many things that moms do behind the scenes when our children are sleeping and the mother's up late working or doing whatever, that they're there working and really um, just really just supporting our children in the household. We often know First Kings is most of the times we hear First Kings or we study First Kings, we see because we talk about how King Solomon asked for what? We, he asked for wisdom. In verse five, it says, God said to him, ask for whatever you want and I will give it to you. King Solomon, he doesn't ask for money or, or riches or, or, for, or, or glory, anything like that. He asked for wisdom. So this story in chapter three begins for this young lady and these ladies in verse 16. We don't know who they are. We don't know their names, but we do know one thing. And that one thing in particular is this. We know that she's a harlot. We know that she's a prostitute. We know that she's working in the red light district. You know that she's working on the corner of the street where she just little short mini skirt, you know, two top or whatever, high heel, red bottoms, whatever it can be green or blue, whatever you want. But she's in the red light district working possibly to, to earn money and take care of her family. Or maybe she's being used by a person who's extortioning her. But we do know that she's working in the red light district and that she's in the presence of King Solomon. She's working in the red light district and she in the presence of King Solomon. Verse 16 says this. Now, two women who were harlots, prostitutes, came to the king and stood before him. I'm asking myself, how does a prostitute stand before a king? Like, how can a prostitute get access to a king? I can't go up to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and go see president. Obama, Bush, Reagan, right? Go ahead and try that. Go ahead and try to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C., and go see the president. I promise you two things are going to happen. You're going to get laughed at or locked up, right? Because there's no way or shot at. There's no way that he can just go before the king. The king has a busy schedule. The king has a nation to run. But I love the fact that there's certain protocols that King Solomon began to begin to walk out because it's written out in Exodus chapter 18. See, in Exodus chapter 18, uh, Moses is visited by his father-in-law Jethro. And he began to talk to Jethro and Moses began to see um, how busy he is and begin to say, Jethro begins to say to Moses, this is what I want you to do. This is verse 13 of Exodus chapter 18. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around with him morning to evening. That means Moses was working from sunup to sundown. When his father-in-law saw this, all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, why are you doing all of this for these people? Why do you alone just judge? And you have all these people standing around you. And you're working from sun up to sundown. Moses answered him and says, because people come to me to seek the will of God. 
whenever they have a dispute, is brought to me. And I have to decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you to do alone. He says, listen, listen to me now, and I will give you some advice. This is Jethro talking to Moses. He says, you must be the people's representative before God and bring their dispute to him. Teach them God's decrees and instructions and show them the way that they're supposed to live. But select among you capable men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, if not hundreds, and 50 to 10 thousands, and have them serve as judges. What Moses was telling, what Jethro was telling Moses was this. The work that you're called to do is too much. Surround yourself with people to help carry the weight. And so this is the reason why once we go to 1 Kings, Solomon, there is a line of people that has to, this young lady, this, this woman, this mother has to go through before he, she even sits before the king. My first point is this. My first point is that a mother's persistence. A mother's persistence. She had to push her way through the politics to see the king, the different layers to see the king. I remember taking my son Ashton to um, Washington, D.C. for his fifth grade field trip. And the class wanted to actually tour the White House. And for him to tour the White House, we had to do background checks for the classroom. And, you know, just have you guys ever been to the White House with your kids before? Like, it's just not like you sign up and go. Like, it's, it's a process that you have to go through. It's different layers that you have to kind of walk through. And so what we see here is that this mother went through different layers to be persistent to advocate for her child. Moms are persistent in advocating for their children. She didn't give up. She wasn't, she didn't keep quiet. She kept being persistent. But then I began to ask, why does she go through all this trouble? Because her child was right before her. Like she wanted the best for her child. She was not going to just take sitting down that her child's destiny, his future was in her hands. It was her persistence. It's a mother's persistence. A mother will keep calling the doctor. A mother will keep calling the coach. A mother will keep calling the teacher. A mother will keep calling the mentors. It's the mother's persistence that helped raise the children. She didn't give up. She didn't get up and give up until she sat before the king. She didn't give up until she heard the king's voice. She didn't give up until she got a yes. She did not give up until she heard the king's voice. Mothers, I don't know where you are with your children. If you have a child that's kind of waywardly walking, if they're just kind of going, doing to and fro, don't give up on your child until you hear the king's voice. Guys, that's a shift. We're not talking about King Solomon. We're talking about the king of kings and the lords of lords. Like mothers, I need you to be to a point where you're going to keep continue to advocate for your child week after week, day after day, month after month, year after year. I don't care if it takes 10 years or 20 years, or 100 years. Continue to advocate for your children. Continue to advocate until you hear the king's voice. 
pray without ceasing. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. Ask, seek, knock. Continue to advocate for your child. When I begin to look at this passage of Scripture, I begin to think to myself, if King Solomon is willing to see a prostitute, then what will the God of all creation is willing to do? If a prostitute can stand before King Solomon, then so can I. If a prostitute can stand before King Solomon, then so can you. That fornicator can stand before the king of kings. That adulterer can stand before the king of kings. That thief can stand before the king of kings. That homosexual can stand before the king of kings. That liar can stand before the king of kings. Whatever you are, whoever you are, you fill in the blank. You can stand before the king of kings. Verse 9 says this. Somewhere during that evening, the woman's son died and lays him besides the mother. She takes the dead child and puts it beside the mom whose child is living and takes the living child and places it beside her. I'm beginning to think, like, that's just rude. Like... That's, that's some gangster type stuff, right? Like, first of all, I'm going to know if my child's being moved from side. You know, I just got spidey senses. I'm sorry. I'm just going to make sure that things are in place. But what makes her think that she can do that? Mothers know their children. Like my brother and I, you know, we're identical twins. And, you know, my brother has... Um, a big mole on his ankle. That's how my mom told us apart back in the day. Because, you know, we're just both crying. We're both kind of sounding like, but as we begin to age, you know, she can tell us apart. And so um, I was going to, Brian and I, we're going to kind of dress alike. I was going to move out and come back in and let you get, figure out which one's Pastor Ryan, which one's B. But I said, you know what? I don't want to do that for you, you know, today. But my thing is this. I begin to think to myself, how did the mom begin to, when she woke up, she looked at the baby and said, this isn't my child. Think about it. She looks at the child and says, this isn't my child. So I'm thinking to myself, is it possible that the two children look alike? Right? I'm thinking to myself, well, if they look alike, then that means they might be sisters. Same, you know, genetics and DNA. And the, the second theory is that it could be the same watering hole from the water supplier, right? 21st century version. Let me hear it. Same baby daddy, right? So, I mean, let's, let's think about this. She got up in the middle of the night, took the son from my side. While I was asleep, she put him up under her breast and put the dead son up under her and took the living son, put it up under him. And when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't my son. When I looked at him closely, meaning that they resembled from one another. But then I begin to think about this, too. A mother's love, a mother's persistence. But even more so, I begin to think about when we read the scripture in chapter three, it says something about the only two people that were living in that house was the two mothers. It takes two to tangle. So where's the father? Where is the father in this story? He's absent. 
the Father is absent. And I believe this, that the absence of a father could be the absence of a complete formation. That the absence of a father could be the absence of complete formation, meaning this. Ladies, my hat goes off to you. I'm a byproduct of a single parent household. My mom raised four kids, so I get it. But there's something that a father provides that a mother just can't provide. We can try, we can try to substitute it or, or trying to have people to, to advocate and walk them through. God, I, I thank you for that. So men, we need to be present in our homes. We have to be present in the homes. Because clearly we see here where the absence of the father is not there. So the mothers, she's doing this without them. And that's, we hear that today, right? Many moms today are raising their family without the support of the husbands or their fathers or their dads. But the mother shows up before the king to advocate for her child. The mother shows up before the king to advocate for their child. The mother stands before the judge to advocate for her children. So let me just fill in a blank. Ladies, take that joker to court and get all you can get. Come on now. I'm going to keep it real. I'm going to keep it real. It's in the scriptures. Right? First Kings chapter three. That she went before a judge to advocate for her child. If you need to email me, Or call me, we can talk about it. But take that brother to court to do, to make sure that he's doing right by that child. Might not like it. It's tight, but it's right. Amen? Okay. Yeah, I got quiet on that one. Okay, it's all good. As she began to examine her child that she, that she birthed, right? She gave birth to this child. She looks at him closely and she says, I'm not, I won't stop until I see the king and the king declares that this child is mine. She refuses to accept anything less than that. Moms, thank you. Thank you for setting the stage to refuse anything less than what your child has been built to do. Thank you for standing in the gap for anything less than a good report card. Thank you for standing in the gap to make sure that that child receives the fullness of what God has called them to be. Moms, thank you for standing in the gap and pushing your children to be all that God has called them to be. Thank you for standing in the gap for making sure that when they go to the doctors and a doctor's report is not what you believe that God has called that to be. Thank you for standing in the gap for that. Thank you, moms, for standing in the gap for anything less than what you want your child to be. Solomon is asking, what do you want me to do? So he's at a dilemma. He's at a dilemma where he has to make a decree about this child. On one hand, he says, you know what, just bring me a sword. We'll cut the child in two, then that'll be done. But then the mom says, no. Wait. I'll sacrifice my son's life and being with me for my son's life. She was willing to sacrifice being with her child so that way her son can live. My second point is a mother's sacrifice. There's going to be a picture on the screen. This picture kind of represents a particular lady who's under 40, who's unmarried. She's unemployed, living on welfare. So a single mom, unmarried, unemployed, living on welfare, and she's under 40. 
you already have this image of who this mom is, right? You see before. So let me just add to the pie. She's unmarried. She's under 40. She's unemployed. She's living in welfare. And she has six kids. Mm. Unmarried, unemployed, under 40, living on welfare with six kids with four different fathers. Okay? Unmarried, unemployed, living on welfare, six different kids, six kids, four different fathers, and under 40. She tells her 16 year old son, Michael. You know, when you get home from school, stay home, do your homework, do your chores, and I'll call check in on you. This is the daily routine for this mom. So this particular day, April 27, was a funeral of Freddie Gray, which was a killing in Baltimore, Maryland. She calls home. She sees on TV that there's a peaceful protest that was scheduled. And what happens is that this peaceful protest that was scheduled came to more or less a riot. So this unmarried, unemployed, mother of six, under 40, living on welfare by six, four different fathers, calls home and her son doesn't pick up the phone. So she sees this protest with hundreds of kids downtown at the mall. So what do you think the mama do? She goes downtown to go get her son. In a crowd of hundreds of kids, she calls out his name. Not only does she calls out his name, she points him out by person, by specifically knowing who he was. As you can see in the picture, there's another slide here. This dude has a black hoodie on, a mask, and the mama says, from hell or high water, I'm going to make sure that you're going to live right by me, that I would not let you be another Freddie Gray. She goes down to this mob, grabs her son, picks, picks him out out of a crowd of a hundred, well, hundreds of kids, close to a thousand or so, calls out Michael, and she knows exactly where he is. But more importantly, he knows his mother's voice. If you haven't seen an angry black mama before, <laughs> let me introduce you to one. And I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be biased. You ain't seen an angry white mama, Puerto Rican mama, oh Latino mama. Woo, boy, come on now. That's a whole nother level. They would take off the chunkla and they will they'll, they'll come at you. And the way that I grew up, you got it from the mama next door, the mama next door. And the mama next door, when your mama get home, guess what? You're going to get it again. So Michael sees his mother. The mama goes down into this mob of people throwing bricks and rocks at the police, full gear. Takes her son, grabs him by the head, and starts just going in on him. Praise God for that. Amen. Can I get amen, mama? Yes. We need more mamas like that. I'm, just, I'm speaking the truth. In this generation, we need more mamas like that who are, who are willing to go into the thick of things. Who's willing to sacrifice their own life to save their children. So she was interviewed by CNN. And an interview person asked her, Why did you go down there? She said, that was my child. And I would do anything I need to do for my children. So Toya Graham, weeks, years later, the reporters kind of report that the young man is doing great because the mother was willing to go into the thick of things She was willing to sacrifice her own life for that of her child. As I begin to kind of just wrap this up, our worship team can make their way to the stage. I want to make sure y'all go to the restaurant on time. 
And you're not blaming me for it. Amen. In this story here, 1 Kings chapter 3, we don't hear the story of what happens after the king makes his decree. He says this in verse 20. It says that she got up in the middle of the night, took my son from beside me when I was asleep. She laid her head her dead child in my arms and took mine to sleep beside her. In the morning when I tried to nurse my son, he was dead. But when I looked up closely that the morning light, he was not my child. The king says this. Let it get straight to the facts. Both of you claim that this living child is yours. And he says this dead one belongs to the other. All right. He says, bring me a sword. So bring me a sword and he brought it to the king. He says, cut the living child in two, and I'll give one half to the one mother and the other half to the other mother. The woman who was the real mother of the living child who loved him for him, the very much cried out, oh, my Lord, give her the child. Please do not kill him. But the other woman said, all right, he will be neither mine nor yours. Divide him between us. Then this is what King Solomon says. Do not kill the child, but give him to the woman who wants to live, wants him to live, for she is surely his mother. We don't know what happened to the young man, but we can believe this, that he's standing today because of his mother's sacrifice, that he's standing today for the mother's persistence, that he's alive that he was prayed for, that he was taken before the king. Mothers, have you taken your children before the king? But I love this story. In the very beginning, the scripture says that she was a prostitute. That King Solomon noted that she was a prostitute. But in verse 26, the language changed. 27, he says this, give the woman who wants him to live to her for he is his mother. Solomon no longer saw a prostitute. He saw a mother. When you go before the king, he doesn't see you as Whatever you have, fill in the blank. He sees you as his child. And so today I'm just reminded about the sacrifice that mothers make. The sacrifice that where they're willing to lay down their lives. To go into the thick of things. And there's so much more that we can extrapolate from this passage of scripture. Like at some point. The son knew or would know that the mother was a prostitute. He's, she's no longer that. When you go before the king of kings and the lords of lords, all that who you were goes away. And all that God has called you to be stands before him. And so mothers on this Mother's Day, I know many or some may go back and reflect I used to do this. I used to be this. For those who have lost children, those who may have had an abortion for whatever medical reason or reason that you may have, you are no longer that who you used to be. You are God who are you are who God called you to be. You are the sons and daughters of the most high God. So as we celebrate Mother's Day today, I just want you to remember that as you stand before the king, he wants to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And the only way that you can hear that is if that you are living up under his decrees, which is, I mean, you have to accept his son as his Lord, as your Lord and Savior. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The past has gone away that he gives you a new creation. He wants you to walk in the newness of who he is. And so church, as we stand to our feet.
I just want to give a special thanks to my mom who has raised four kids. And I'm going to be honest, it was rough. We had our, 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 our trials and our struggles, but we came out halfway decent. And I, I want to thank the moms that's here too, raising your children. Keep pressing, keep moving. You guys are doing an amazing job. And I think the staff kind of figure out how to make me tick when typically I'm, I'm kind of bullheaded. I just do what I want to do from time to time. But when they say, I'm going to tell your mama, <laughs> I'm like, that's enough. That's cool. I kind of line up. And so today, guys, just celebrate your moms, love on them, cherish them, thank them for doing all that they've done. Thank them for the sacrifices that they've made. Thank them for how they're willing to go without so that way you can have. There's been plenty of times where my mom laid down her preferences to provide for her family. So mamas, we love you today. We thank you. We salute you. All that you are, your job is not finished. Keep praying, keep asking, and keep seeking. And the God who is all God's will continue to do what he does. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you for watching today's video. If you made a commitment of any kind or you made a first time decision to accept Christ, we want to hear from you. Email us at info at onechurchnc.net. If today's message encouraged you, we want to encourage you to give so that we can continue to share the hope of Jesus. You can do that by visiting onechurchnc.net slash give.